But we're doing it for the next generation. This is a this is a lifelong journey. This evolution we have here. I'm standing on the shoulders of other ancestors as well. What I would say to people is whatever spiritual path you have, lean on it, draw on it, because this is a marathon, not a sprint. And as an Eastern philosophy, don't get attached to the outcome. You do good because good is good to do. If you get attached to the outcomes, you will always fall into the trap of change isn't happening fast enough. I've been marching here, I've been marching there, I've been doing this, I've been doing that. I get that. I get it because people are saying, man, I've been protesting this shit since the 60s or 50s. I get that. And that's only human. But you can, you have to move past it at some point. But even now, I never thought I would see the things in this country that I've seen already. You got to accentuate the positive. Wow! I feel good. A little bit of feel good goes a long way. You're listening to Karen Swain, teacher of deliberate creation, accentuating the positive, showing you a way to a better life. Accentuating the positive, it's not just fad, it's sanity. Who in their right mind would accentuate anything else? If you feel like that's what you want to do. Hello and welcome to another show, Accentuating the Positive with Karen Swain. Wonderful to be with you again. And remember, if you are enjoying the conversations, please share them and like and subscribe and all that stuff and leave a comment when you do. It helps the algorithms, helps people see the shows further. So I really appreciate it if you share the shows. I have the beautiful Reverend Michael Carter with me today. Welcome to the show. My pleasure. (laughs) Karen, it's my pleasure. I've been looking forward to this all day. Oh, I know. Well, it's morning for me here in Australia and afternoon, late evening or yes. late afternoon. It's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's early evening. Seven. It's 10 after 7 in the evening. Dinner time. So where are you in the US? I'm in Asheville, North Carolina. I'm uh, in the Appalachian Mountains here uh, in the western part of the state. Gorgeous. It's gorgeous here. Uh, and uh, just surrounded by these mountains and the Cherokee Reservation is about 45 minutes from here. This is all Cherokee land. And um, I moved here about 13 years ago. Yeah, you were in New York for a while, weren't you? Uh, yeah, I was, I was born in Baltimore and I moved to New York, stayed there for almost 30 years, uh, got married uh, a second time, came here, started a family, uh, wheels came off the marriage, we're good co-parents, and uh, I'm here, I'm here. I have a congregation here uh, in Black Mountain, North Carolina, which is about 25 minute drive, and uh, it's a Unitarian Universalist congregation, and that's how I make my livelihood. I'm an anti-racism trainer, and well, hang on, I'm going to get into it. Let me read your extensive bio. Oh, you're going to read that. bio, because you've done a lot, Michael. You've been I know, around, I honey. Cannot, I can't believe how much I did. And so I'm going to tell people all about it, if you can bear with us. And yeah, okay. Here we go. Reverend Michael J. Carter is an ordained interfaith minister and received his BA degree in Letters of the College of New... No, I don't know how to say this. Rochelle? Yes, it's, I, I got my degree in letters from the College of New Rochelle, yes. And graduated with cum laude. What does that mean? Cum laude, is, it's Latin for with honors. Oh, okay. So I'm totally reading it wrong. He received his Master's in Divinity degree from the Union Theolo- Theosophical Society in New York, class of 2000, while serving a various utilitarian university. T. It's Congregate. Unitarian un, Unitarian Universalist. You are, okay, these big words. Congregations in New York. Michael was trained as an anti-racism trainer and has been recognised by President Clinton for his efforts. He now serves as a minister for the Unitarian... I can't even say these words. Unitarian Universalist. Unitarian Universalist. Congregation of, as you said... Uh, the Valley. The Valley. Beautiful mountains, North Carolina. Long time UFO and ET experiencer, 
Michael, Reverend Carter, has written articles on UFO and religion for UFO magazines, Alien Encounters, British publication, the MUFON UFO Journal, Contact Forum, the SPACE, S-P-A-C-E, uh, Letter Support Program for Abductees, Contact Encounters, UFO uh, and UFO support groups in New York City. He's also spoken at UFO conferences such as the Edgar Casey. Uh, our ARE Ancient Mystery Conference, the annual Long Island UFO Conference, the late with the late Bud Hopkins. So you met Bud Hopkins, did you? Was very friendly with Bud. Oh, how gorgeous! Yeah, I lost my place. Where am I now? <laughs> God, you've done so much, uh, and many other, and you've done the inter international UFO conference, Scottsdale, and Arizona. You've appeared mm -hmm. on many radio and television appearances across the nation, including on Japanese television discussing yes. Bible and UFO. I find that really yeah. interesting that you were discussing the Bible and UFO on Japanese television. Yeah. Also lecturing on the topic of religion and spirituality and UFOs. He's appeared on the Sci-Fi Channel, Steven, St Steven Spielberg's production of Abduction Diaries and The Real 4,400. Uh, and was frequent guest on the History Channel production of Ancient Aliens and UFOs, The Hidden Evidence, which currently airs on the Travel Channel. So there's still yeah. stuff airing with you on television. Yes. Ah, cool. Other TV appearances include being a regular consultant on the History Channel's Ancient Alien series. Uh, you've also been interviewed by Shirley MacLaine. Bless her heart. Love, Shirley. George Norrie from Coast to Coast, and you're on Beyond Belief on Gaia TV and Late Night in the Desert with Heather Ward. Also on the advisory board of the Foundation for Research and into Extraterrestrials Free. You must know my friend Mary Rodwell. Do you know Mary? Yes, I do know Mary. Oh, yes. Uh, author Whit Whitley Strieber, which I think many people would know if they're into the UFO phenomena, who wrote the book, uh, what was his first book? Communion. 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 Has said about you, your first book, Alien Scriptures, Extraterrestrials in the Holy Bible, the best book ever written on the topic. That's a bit of a boon from Whitley. Yes, it Other is. Other books include A New World, if you can take it, God, Extraterrestrials, and the Evolution of Human Consciousness. God, Consciousness, a 30-day meditation manual to God-centered thinking. And your latest book is The Metaphysics of Spiritual Healing and the Power of Affirmative Prayer. Mm -hmm. Wow. You've done a lot. And you know what's amazing? I have not seen you on any of those things. I had never actually heard of you until yeah. somebody sent me a, a YouTube of Preston Dennett talking. Yes, Preston, yes. Yeah, and he mentioned you on that. And he mentioned many, many people. But your name just stuck out. And I just went, hmm, let me look this guy up, right? <laughs> so I looked I, up. I called him like right after we talked and thanked him for mentioning me. Yeah, he mentions me in his book. Yeah. on uh, ufo healings yeah his second book is called well he has two books one uh ufo healings one and ufo healings two and he has my story in in that book which i was very flattered that he used it yeah and preston and i are going to have a chat in a couple of weeks for the show so we'll get to hear more about preston and what he's been up to oh he's wonderful he is isn't he look i was fascinated with your story because you know, the whole UFO ET phenomena has been so vilified by society at large, mm -hmm. more so by religion, right? So here you yes. are, you know, yes. straddling both camps. And I just thought yes. this is very cool. And not only do you straddle the camps, but you, you also showcase how the phenomena of extra dimensional extraterrestrial life has been written in the Bible and, and, and documented many times, but let's go into why you got into it. What happened? Cause you had an amazing experience. What happened? What was the first thing that happened? Yes. Um, I, you know, I, I continue to have these visitations, but now years go by in between, which happens at times and they come in clusters on December 28th, 1989, I went to uh, Mexico uh, with the person I was dating at that time who later became my first wife. 
and we went to see the pyramids in Chichen Itza and Tulum. Now, I must preface this by saying I was raised in the American Baptist tradition, no longer, and I did not believe in UFOs, did not watch Star Trek, any of that stuff, which I'm glad because people would probably say now, oh, you got that stuff from Star Trek. But anyway, uh, on, we came back home and I went to a, a, a party. A friend of mine invited me to, I was tired. I wanted to show off my tan. It was freezing in New York. That's the great thing about going to warm places. You can gloat. And so I went and I stayed for about 90 minutes. No uh, adult beverages consumed, lots of deviled eggs. I love deviled eggs. And then I went back home. And that, I don't know to this day whether I had to go to the bathroom or whatever, but I felt the presence in the room. And I looked at the, at the foot of my bed and there was a person who um, was, had the phenotype of a gray, but was not gray, was chalk white but had the pear head, the wraparound eyes, very spindly, and had a jumpsuit. And it, it was like Reynolds wrap. It was like what you wrap foil, tin foil in. And I have never been as scared. And I've had some interesting experiences. And I have never been as scared, as frightened as I was then. And I pulled the covers up over my head and got in the, fe the fetal position. Now, my room was lit up. My girlfriend at the time did not wake up. It was like she would not get up. And then I heard this sound, like the wind, like whoosh, whoosh, And it felt like I was outside. Now, I was in a, I was on the, um, God, we, we lived on the, the, the 12th floor at that time. No, the 15th floor, 1506. So, it felt like I was outside. It was a, and then I pulled the covers down and no one was there. It was like nothing ever happened. She got up and we talked and she's very open-minded. So she didn't think, what are you talking about? Uh, uh, and we're very close to this day. It's my first ex-wife, a very spiritual person. So what had happened was, I started getting these, she worked at night. And so twice a month, full and new moon, I would get visits, like clockwork. They would paralyze me. No words were exchanged, just either telepathy or pictures in my head. I started, I was a wreck. I, I couldn't sleep at night. I, it just up until maybe a few, well, even to even now, but not as much, I will not turn the light off when I go to sleep until I'm right at the brink of sleep. It's like post-traumatic stress. Now, as if turning off the light would keep them from coming. <laughs> but, but what had happened was, um, I, 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 a lot of things were happening. I was telling her about it. She was very patient and careful with me. I talked to some friends of mine about it who didn't think I was crazy. And one day I went to a bookstore called, um, oh God, I forgot the name of the bookstore. It's on Spring Street downtown. Mm -hmm. And anyway, I bought all the books I could on UFOs. And I went up to the cashier and I, I felt like I was a little boy buying condoms or something. I couldn't look the guy in the face. And he was just taking the books and he was saying, mm-hmm, 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 okay. And he said, uh, is this for real or is it a hobby? And I said, it's, it's for real. He said, yeah, he said, you don't look very well. I said, oh, he said, and he wrote down a support group and he gave it to me. And he said, call that number. And it was for the space group, S-P-A-C-E. Now, this is how I met Bud. Bud was with a group, but his group saw their experiences as negative. Right. Because they were having, you know, anal probes and all. I wasn't getting that. 
okay? And once in a while, the space group would get together with Bud's group, but there was this major, we were like John Mack's side of the thing, that this could be a spiritual experience. Realizing that not for everybody, Bud's group would not budge that it would be maybe not so good for them for other people. That's how I met Bud. And he regressed me a couple of times. Very good at what he did, yes. Okay, hang on. Hold on, we'll back up a little bit here. So, okay, sure. met Bud. You're still in 1989. This is still 1989. No, when I went into the 90s, because remember, this first thing was December 28th, 1989. Oh, okay. I was, okay, and okay. I was going to the space group at that time. I was still having encounters, full and new moon. Okay, but I was meeting other people who were having these encounters, and so I didn't feel like I was crazy. So, when he regressed you, what did you find out? When, I, when, when Bud regressed me, I found out that I was on a ship. You know, the, the, the story you hear from everybody, that I was on the table. Of course, I was screaming and hollering, and they were trying to, to calm me down. But what Bud and I disagreed on was not what he was finding, but that I did not feel that it was traumatic. It was traumatic initially. And that's where my spiritual growth came. I also had someone regress me years before, Bud, Dr. Jean Mundy. She's passed away. I found her in the back of a book called Encounters by Dr. Edith Fiore. In the back of the book, they had healthcare professionals who worked with people like me and other contactees. And she told me, this, this good news is that you're not crazy. You can decide whether it's bad news, but it's going to keep going on. And I've read everything I could about the phenomenon, and I was in the support group. Then I ran across a book by Dr. the Reverend Dr. Barry Downing, who's not an experiencer, but he wrote a book back in 1968 called The Bible and Flying Saucers. He's a, he's a, a Rhodes Scholar. He's a retired Presbyterian minister. But he incorporated it into his Christianity, which I did at first. He, he, he acknowledged that UFOs existed, but it still fit his Christian worldview. Jesus uh, was probably an extraterrestrial, which I agree with, or at least a hybrid, those type of things. Mm -hmm. And so he and I became friendly. He's also on ancient aliens occasionally. You can't miss him. He wears a little collar and I don't wear a collar anymore. It's too austere. But so that's how this thing started and then I was seeing grays and then I saw reptilians then I saw um a, a blue person which I thought was an Arcturian uh I, I I had a UFO healing from some blonde people which Preston knew about um and so I'd seen these different species what the journey helped me because I was post-traumatic stress they would just pop up you know I I had my eyes closed I was always awake it wasn't dreamy. And you know, you open your eyes and there's a beat, you know what I mean? You could get a heart attack. You're seeing him through your physical eyes. and Yes, well, they've touched me, they touched me. I mean, they're real, it's not ethereal. But what had happened was they helped me work through my fear, not consciously, but I started saying, Michael, yes, there were some things that they did that kind of were kind of painful. But in the long run, I had to tell myself, these people have not hurt you. They have meant you no harm. If anything, your life has gotten better, it's especially the opening of my heart and it deepened my inner life, my spirituality after meeting them. And so I had to talk my, and I had to look at where else in your life do you let fear get in the way? So that was the largest lesson that I learned from those experiences. What happened was I learned through therapy and what have you to just integrate that into my life. And so at one time, that's all I could talk about. If we weren't talking about UFOs or anything, I couldn't really be engaged. But I'm not like that. As a matter of fact, there's so much stuff going on in the world that you know, I talk about this when you call me or what have you, but I'm a father, I have, I have a child. Um, there's a lot of social unrest and racial upheaval going on here. 
Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with what's going on here in the States. And so I'm engaged in other things. So rather than that being all I can talk about, I have a much fuller life. Yeah. Okay. So when you were regressed back then by both Bart and the other person, you know, Dr. Jean Mundy, yes. Was, regression was different then. I think that, uh, De, you know, Dolores Cannon was a pioneer in the new regression because they used to just take you back so that you could recall memory. And now what happens is in regression, not only do you recall memory in this life and other lives, but they take you to your soul, you know, your soul planning session or your soul contract or your higher self. And you get to see why this is happening to you as opposed to what happened. So back in the day, regression was just about what happened. And, and, and people were viewing it from their linear human mind perspective, which is rooted in fear mostly when there's something that is unusual happening. And when you view it from a higher perspective, you understand that there's something else going on. Have you done that? I didn't need to do that because I knew there was something else going on. What I did though, I did have some past life regressions that, and that, that, you know, were, were not as specific. I went to Bud and Gene were uh, talking about UFOs. Past life regressions were something else. I was even shown some past lives from uh, these intelligences, but I didn't really need that because I intuitively knew that there was a call. The time that they came, I was an actor in New York. I was living a really fast life sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and doing these shows and what have you. And when they came to me, the, it, it snapped me out of that. They certainly didn't say, you shouldn't be doing that, young man. But it was a wake-up call that you could be doing more. You could be doing more. And that was never said. It was felt Yeah. by me. So if you were pursuing an acting career back then, when did that shift to want to be a minister and start? It, well, I always wanted to be a minister or a therapist. Okay. It's interesting because now I'm in a relationship with a woman who's a therapist. But um, I wanted to be a minister. I wanted to be a priest. I didn't know the, vo the nomenclature, the vocabulary. I was a very religious child because my parents were, and part of that was probably trying to, to, prove, to, to, to get them, you know, so they could be proud. But... Um, what had happened was after I started having these experiences, you know, the search for fame and all this, a lot of the ego stuff got turned down a bit. Not that it's wrong to want to be an actor or what have you. It's just that um, I had a, another calling. But those same skills I used, how to get a message across, public speaking, marketing myself, I'm using that now in what I'm doing now. Most of my work is public speaking. In the church, whether I'm doing anti-racism or diversity work, um, I'm in front of crowds of people. And um, the t you know, being an actor helps me when I do these TV shows. I've been in front of a camera. I'm not shy. I know my way around a set. Yeah. I know how to limit you know, just how to present myself. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I was going, I thought I was going to be Denzel Washington and I wound up being a minister. <laughs> Boom. So th there's an intelligence out there. <laughs> I, I was going to be Denzel Washington. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Look, it definitely, you know, pursuing an acting career for some people, ha it, it gives them that platform from which to speak. I, I've, I've worked with many actors Mm -hmm. uh, that have wanted to come out of the spiritual closet and 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 give yeah. them, you know and and when they get that fame it's actually harder because they feel like they're going to be even more ridiculed when you're just a normal person you get ridiculed by your friends and family but when you come out like shirley like shirley mclean right when you come out as a, a as an actor who's got some notoriety then you've got the whole world ridiculing you so it's harder for them to come out it's difficult of, and it's also the point that it's the only business that has a 99 percent unemployment rate <laughs> and so for me, I, you know, I'm looking for work. After a while, my friends got ex more excited when I got a show than I did. 
because and I said, do I really want to go through? Because even big stars have to audition for stuff. Do I want to spend my life doing this? And uh, the answer was no. I, I know women who put off having children and and put off things that they really wanted to do, chasing this whatever it is. And I'm not again, I'm not condemning that. Some of them were very unhappy afterwards because let's face it, most people don't reach that type of fame. Yeah. And no, and there are a lot there, there are a lot of working there are a lot of working actors out here that you never hear of. Yeah. I think that type of fame would be like being in prison actually. You know, your life's not your own. Okay, like, let's get back to the UFO thing. So what did they say to you these visitors these um so you, you first of all you saw a gray type alien that looked chalky white yeah yeah it was a different phenotype it's what we would call a gray but he wasn't gray well he, he or she he and was he was, he was chalk white communicate anything with you did they say anything to you no they didn't say anything to me in the initial uh they would show me pictures uh one day they showed me a, a picture of me as a monk uh in a in a past life and right next to it uh was a picture of me in modern times with a suit that i had in my closet at the time speaking in front of a a, a crowd of people they showed me that um i was doing some anti-racism training um in in boston and i went up there and they visited me in boston and they showed me which is on my business card now they showed me my hands a, a pair of hands in prayer with a lightning bolt through it huh. and it was a it was an icon of a gray going look as if pointing at and i and right after i started having these experiences i immediately became a reiki master so they were telling me you know you this is what you can do this you you can do um energy work uh uh, uh so that that was it the only person that i heard speak to me was the reptilian and his words were and the only reason I said it was a he because his voice was masculine. Don't be afraid. Okay. And and you know people people hear that. That's easy for them to say because they just walk through your wall. Of course you're going to be afraid. But I get it. They're trying to turn it down a bit. Um, okay. So, so what did the reptilian show you? If he didn't speak to you, did he give you? No, the reptilian didn't show me anything. He just came in the room. Right. He touched me and said, "Don't be afraid." Yeah. And he looked at me, and it was very hypnotizing because. His eyes were yellow, but his pupils went this way. Yeah. Instead of, they're like a cat. Like a cat, yeah. Yeah, and he had a tail. And he walked right through my, my bedroom, right through the wall, and he left the same way he came in. He didn't sort of say what he wanted, why he was there? No. Nope. And what did you get out of that? What, what? Did you? I didn't get anything out of that. I just got um, that these races, I don't know whether they talk to people. You need to go visit that guy. He's got a lovely apartment or whatever. I don't know what they do. But all I know I is that Denzel. I started just, I started seeing, he's got, he's a great guy. You need to see. But, but all I know is that I just could, it was something that wasn't intellectualized. My life just started changing. Yeah, I started. I started. Uh, my hair grew faster. Uh, skin and nails, uh, you know, grew. I mean, I was. I don't know. I felt smarter. I felt like I was much more intelligent. I. Um, my heart was so open. I, w I. I just lost a lot of fear about being wrong. About I could say I love you. I didn't have that part of that ego thing that was keeping me. Now I was working on it. It isn't just them, you know, at the time I was reading existential philosophy, I was meditating, I was doing yoga, I was doing, I mean, I was doing, I was working toward this, but I think they accelerated it. But they did get me out of that, the, the box that was Christianity for me. And I want to be clear, I am not anti-Christian. Jesus is um, um, a guide for me by many guides. But any God that's in Jesus is in you and I as well. And they got me out of that, uh, uh, the religion of my childhood, yeah. in a way. And so um, I, I'm, I'm very thankful to this day 
for that. But that's, that's how I could see the right book came my way when I needed it. The right person came my way. These synchronicities started to happen and I was open to them. And of course I was just reading everything I could uh, because that's what I did anyway. I, I'm, I'm, I'm more of a philosopher by nature. Uh, and you know, I, I was still, you know, living life. I, I, I lost a lot of friends. Uh, not because of what I believe, but I, 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 I had to live my life. It's like, okay, I had a, a visitation. Now, I could call my therapist or I could call a friend, but I still had to get up and go to work that morning. The world's not going to stop because Michael had a eureka moment or, you know what I mean? And so I just started incorporating it into my life. And I will tell you this, and of course we have time to go into it. When I go to these conferences, I do, I have a PowerPoint and I show the biblical stuff and, you know, I have some things up there and we discuss. But I, the last half hour of my talks, usually they're two hours, two and a half hours. I don't talk about UFOs. I talk about the change that happened to me because of it. Now there's some deeply spiritual people out here who've never had these experiences because the point is this. If I have a, a visitation tonight, tomorrow morning, I have two people I need to visit. I have to pick up my daughter. I, I'm living, you know, there's a lot of racial strife and tension going on now. It's a lot of stuff going on. I have to deal with that. I cannot be in a bubble. So what helps me deal with that is my spirituality. And so when, and when I start talking about that, you can hear a pin drop in the place. Because people want to know, how can I get through day to day? because everybody's having experiences now, where they're all coming forward. Now the US military here, they're not, it's not disclosure, but they're saying there are things in the sky, we, we don't know what they are. And so, okay, but I gotta, you know, how do I deal with my neighbor? How do I learn to love how, myself? How do I become a better person? How do we celebrate each other's differences and their different points of view? Yeah, yeah. Look, I get it. You know, like you're a, what do, what do you call yourself? A, uh, I'm a minister. I'm a reverend. But um, with the work that you do. Um, the anti-racism work. Anti and the diversity. Yeah, anti-racism. You know, from their perspective, um, even having an anti-racism sort of therapist seems ludicrous because from their perspective, there is no racism. So earth humans really have to like get with the program with on that, right? So we're so fearful yeah. of each other. We're so fearful of each other's differences. That's right. Whether That's right. skin color or religious or their ideas. Um, and this is really what's holding humanity back in so many ways, not just from being a part of our galactic family and um, the cosmos but it's holding us back in our political systems and our educational mm -hmm. systems in every way shape so i suspect that your work is well needed here on earth <laughs> i'm i'm and i'm seeing that typically because i'm like this if you can if we can't get along with each other what are we going to do with someone who comes from someone who may not even look like us and so but but people are I'll give an example real quick. A friend of mine set me up with a little rural uh, hospital in Wisconsin. This woman after George Floyd was murdered here by the cop, um, she wanted to have an anti, wanted to make her whole hospital anti-racist. Great. So I have, you know, so she called me, I gave her, we have a consulting, you know, I consult with her. <clears throat> so she likes what I have to offer. And she tells the person who calls, so she says, I'll get back to you. She hasn't gotten back to me and she probably won't now. But the, my friend says, she went to your website and she saw that you have all this stuff on UFOs. She said, I like what he, he, the advice he gave me, but what does he believe in UFOs? My point being is this. So rather than just incorporate that, and really that's none of her business. I was helping her with what she wanted. 
But because of that, she couldn't handle it. Yeah, I know. I get it. I've had a chat to the Galactic Federation and, and said, you know, when's disclosure happening? And they've said exactly the same thing. They've said, when you guys learn to get along with each other, then you can hope to have disclosure. Until then, you know, what's the point? Uh, yeah. you, you, you can't cope with somebody who, you know, is sort of looks different, comes from a different country. How are you going to cope with an right. alien that looks like so different, so different and has such a different idea on life and everything. So, um, yeah, so there's all these people out there in the community screaming for disclosure, but the work is not to have the aliens land on the White House lawn. The work is, you know, let's get over this whole judgment thing that we've got going on. Yes, it's the inner work. It's the and until judgment. you're ready to do that, it's it's you 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 you're spitting in the wind. Absolutely, yeah. It's the Christ consciousness work. You know, the great yes. teacher came to Earth two thousand years ago to teach people how to get along. Two thousand yes. yes. and what happens? <laughs> you know, we'll we'll nail you to a piece of wood. This is this is the mentality. Yeah. So, um, yeah. I I, I, I like to think I'm raising the frequency with the work that I do, and but I also enjoy my life. I have a lovely daughter, who's fourteen. I was going to say, how old is she? 14? Yeah, she's 14, and we're very, very close. And, you know, I live in a wonderful part of the country. I don't make a lot of money, but I don't need a lot of money. I pay my bills. I can take a vacation once or twice a year. I, I live a good life, and I just try to remember that, uh, just the blessings that I have. What does your daughter think about the work that you do with uh, off-world beings? Well, my daughter has had her own visitations, um, but she was telling me about past lives when she was three, four years old. She wow. used to say, Daddy, I saw you at the airport last night. Uh, and I would say, okay, you mean, you know, I dreamt about you. And I said, okay. And she kept talking about the airport. And I said, baby, what? tell me about this airport. She said, Daddy, you know the airport. The airport is for souls who are coming to the earth and, and the ones that are leaving the earth. Ah. And then she told me uh, one day, she said, don't you remember when you were, you were daddy? I mean, you were mommy and mommy was daddy. You don't remember that. And uh, she told me that one day I said to her, when her mom and I were together, I said, you know, you really make us proud and it's been a blessing and I'm so glad you chose us. And she said, well, I, 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 I told them I wanted to be with you. I liked your hair. I cut my hair the other day, but I had dreadlocks down to my waist. And I cut them last week. And um, she, said, I said, she said, I want him. I like his hair. And I like that woman. That's my mommy. And she said, she said, one day I was in the room behind that chair, and I was watching you and mommy. And you were sitting on the sofa with mommy, and you didn't have your shirt on. And I was like, oh, God, what else did she see? And she said, uh, she said, and I kept telling them, that's, that's where I want to go. That's my daddy. That's where I want to go. And I said, you keep talking about them. Who are they? You keep saying, I told them. And she said, those are the space people, daddy. Those are your friends you told me about. And I said, oh, okay. So, you know, she, she was in, now she doesn't remember saying that, but she does remember her, uh, she told me a, a couple months ago about, one day she came into the room to sleep with her mother and I. This was years ago because we're divorced. And she said a, a, a gray being walked in right through the door while she was lying there between my wife and I. And she said and when, he walked, when, she walked, when it walked over to the, the bed, that's all she remembered. Yeah. Yeah. And it was hard because her mom would get angry with me. Her mom would say, you should, I'm not going to use her language, but she's a mom. And she said, you need to tell those Blank, 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 to leave my child alone. I don't want them around, you know. But as she, but then she got a little, she mellowed out. I said, I can't control that. No. As if you have any control over it. Right. I can't control any of it. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So when did she stop talking about that? When she hit her teens, I suspect. Oh, she stopped talking about past lives probably when she was about six. Oh, okay. And, and the space people, she stopped talking all about it when she was back. No, there's nothing to talk about. She hasn't seen them yet. Yeah. She hasn't seen them since the last time she saw them. So it's nothing, it's nothing to talk about. She doesn't remember. No, she remembers when they come, but they haven't come. They haven't visited her in a while. The most bizarre thing we had was last year, 
I have her on Wednesday nights and I have her every other weekend. And I didn't know this. She, her bedroom is right there. My bedroom is right there. She said she got up in the middle of the night around three o'clock and she went to the bathroom and I was not in my bed. She said that the covers were taken back. She came out here. She said, well, maybe daddy's in the living room. This is a two bedroom apartment. And she said, Dad, you were not in this house. And I was, I was like, oh, my God. Because um, I, I would never get up at 3 o'clock in the morning and leave my daughter here by herself. So I must have been taken away. But she said, yeah, Dad, you weren't here. Wow. You were not here. Yeah. Wow. So they're taking you physically. Um, yeah, I think Preston was talking about uh, the 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 – the thing that I saw him speak on YouTube, he was specifically talking about ETs and healing. And um, yes, yes. And he mentioned you. What was the healing that I can't remember what he said now? What was the healing? That this happened? was the healing. Um, it's in his second book. I, 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 he said, I'm going to write this down. Do you mind? And I said, yeah, but that, I don't mind. But that was years in between. And he said, you should get my book. I bought his book and lo and behold, what had happened was this 2013. July 4th, 2013, at 10 minutes to 10 Eastern Standard Time, was the 4th of July. I have a lot of friends who fought in the Vietnam War that I'm very close with. And I don't like going to, I'll tie all this together, I don't like going to fireworks. Right. Because, you know, you, you, it's just that they're eating you up, the crowded people sitting right next to you. you it takes you longer to drive there than it does for the, after 40 minutes, they turn it off. You know what I mean? You got to get out there at seven o'clock. The fireworks don't start until 930 because it has to be dark. Yeah. yeah. From 930 to 10. So you're actually out there three or four hours for 40 minutes. Anyway, that particular night, I was very happy because it was thunder and lightning. It sounded like artillery. And I was saying to myself, this must be what my friends in Vietnam went through because they were telling me, Michael, we would sleep two hours in the mud and, 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 and you would learn to sleep with artillery coming back and forth. You had to get a couple hours sleep, but it was tremendous. It felt like that. I was lying on my stomach. I was wide awake. I feel this presence in the room. Usually, the atmosphere in my room changes. I can't explain it, but it gets real still. Still. If there are birds outside, it's everything stops. Huh. And I can feel somebody's in my room. I turned around. There was a blonde guy with a, a, a cowl. We call them hoodies, but had a rope like a monk wrapped around had his hair cut like mine, only it was blonde, big blue eyes. You could see his pectoral muscles through the road. Huh. Maybe there's a gym or a workout thing on the ship. I don't know. This guy was ripped. <laughs> and I turned around and I looked at this man. He was tall. He was like, his head would have hit my ceiling. He put his head, oh, this is what I forgot to tell you. In 2013, in January, my dad died. I had a blood clot, and this is where the healing comes in, on my right leg from my ankle to the groin area. So my dad had died, and I was getting divorced. Three things at once. This guy puts out his hand, and a green, an apple green light comes out of his hand, and it hits me in my stomach. I don't feel anything. I'm just like, he does, he, his, he, his molecules, he just kind of faded. Like, it was weird. I looked down at my leg and I was, I, I was trying to get some sleep and I was like, I could have jumped out this window and flew. I looked at my leg which was big like LeBron James's leg. I mean, I wish I had legs built like that. My legs, the blood clot was gone. My leg was normal. The first person I called was Preston. 
okay? Because I figure it's quarter to 10, 10 of 10 here, it's 10 of seven on the West Coast. I got to tell him this. Preston wasn't home. So I left a message. I didn't have the wherewithal to take a picture of my leg. I didn't think. I was like shocked. Yeah. The next day when I called my ex and I went over to see my daughter, I told them what happened and I showed them my leg and they said, oh my God, the blood clot's gone. I said, yeah, that's what I'm trying to tell you. The, and, and, and the part that was the challenge was I had to go to the doctor because with a blood clot, you know, I was on Coumadin, I was injecting myself with blood thinner, something called a nexaparin in my stomach. Right. And the doctor would not let go of what happened. I said, I don't know. I said, I, I, the, the, the medicine's working. He said, no, 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 no. What happened? Medicine doesn't work that fast. I said, I don't know. He said, how did this, you were just here 10 days ago, we took your blood and you still had a significant amount of sweat, swelling. I said, listen, he said, mm. finally, I said to him, aren't you happy for me? He said, well, of course I'm happy. I'm just, I said, are you happy? Are you really happy that I'm well now? He said, well, of course I'm happy. So I put him on the defensive because I couldn't keep going back and forth. And I wasn't going to tell him extraterrestrials came to do it. Oh, I locked him up. No, no. That's his paradigm. Talk about cognitive dissonance. Oh. So, so what I, so, and so they, I said, I don't want to take the medication anymore because they wanted me to keep taking it. Right. Uh, the blood thinner. And I said, no, it's been four months. Yeah. And, and then I told Preston about it that he put it in his, his book. But these people were blonde, blue eyed people. The next night, yeah, I meditated right over here in my little apartment. Well, I'm not going to move it, but yeah. And I was, and, and a blonde person, two of them with tight built with two fitting with, they were tight, real tight uniforms. When I had my eyes closed, they looked at me and blinked and I opened my eyes like what? And I, I closed my eyes again to meditate and they were still there. And then they faded away. And I, I felt it was them saying, yeah, you okay? we did it. So you didn't get a sense of who they are, where they come from, why they... No, I don't get into all that stuff. That doesn't matter to me. I don't even think about that. No, I don't know. But, but yeah. you know, we do have curious human minds and we do like to identify and label things. So why... Yeah, I, but I never, I never get into that with any of them. Why do you Actually, think, Michael, you know, that they came and gave you a healing and they don't do it for everybody? I don't know. Um, I, 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 the, the question for me is like life isn't like that and that everybody has different life paths. Some people have diseases and they choose those diseases and that's for their life's journey. Some people, maybe it's karmic. I mean, you're not going to have 8 billion people all being healed. That's just not the way life works. And so uh, maybe in another time I had something, but this is part of my journey. My journey is not the same as everybody else's. So they're not going to heal 8 billion people because everybody has a different evolution to go through in this incarnation. That's what makes sense to me. Yeah, well said. Yeah, and they also want to make sure that you're healthy so that you can do the work that you're here to do because they see it as important. They see the reconciliation, the, you know, the... Um, we'll get into the Bible and the UFOs too, but they see that the Christ consciousness, which is labeled Christian or religious, but that Christ consciousness is reconciliation is when we, is that oneness of being is knowing that we're all that one. We're all one. Or we're all from the same source, um, you know, experiencing huge variety in, in, um, in ways of living and, and looking and being, and the Christ consciousness is, is celebrating that, really, just celebrating that diversity. Yeah. Viva la difference, rather than yes. fighting the difference. Yeah. So let's get into some of the work that you've done with ETs in the Bible. Yes. Uh, I have to say, I didn't grow up with any religion at all. My parents were like, just ignore all that stuff, darling. <laughs> That's 
<laughs> my religious advice was like, I went to a convent for a couple of years before I left school. What am I going to do about all that religious stuff? I said to mum, she said, just ignore it, darling. That was my religious upbringing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But in some ways, that's perfect. Yeah. Because you don't have to unlearn. You're like a tabula rasa. Yeah, yeah, but you, I, I still have to say, you're still indoctrinated. It's all around you. It's it's just thought forms around you. Even if you don't, if you're not a religion, it's still there. It's interesting. I, I remember when my daughter was two, and a friend of mine who was Catholic got married in the big cathedral in the city, and um, she came from a big Catholic family. And but she was quite rebellious. She got married in a black top hat with a purple skirt on, like she looked quite different. Anyway, so she's walking down the aisle in this massive Catholic cathedral. It's this, it's the biggest one we have in Sydney, which is the biggest city in Australia, right? So mm -hmm. it's quite an honour to be married in this massive, you know, she, her family had connections. Anyway, so she's walking down the aisle in this black top hat with this black tulle and um, a purple velvet, you know, skirt, sort of straight skirt, and... Um, I said to my little baby girl, she's like two, she's not watched television yet. She's too young to watch stuff, you know, when kids are, they can't sit. She said to me, where's the bride? And I said, what do you mean, where's the bride? There's the bride. She goes, that's not the bride. And I started thinking, how would this child know what a bride looks like? It's not yeah. like I've taken her to a wedding before. It's not like she's watched television. It's not like I've shown her books with brides. So it's in the collective. It's in the collective. You know what I mean? It's like religion is. It's just... And we soak it in, even when we're not studying it. It's really interesting. Yeah. And a yeah. lot of the collective um, fear and guilt that religion, you know, be good or you're going to go to hell, you know, you've got to be a good person. It's, we just soak it in. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's, that's a great segue because that's what made me have to look at the Bible in a different way. Right. I, I, I still think it's a wonderful book. There are a lot of life lessons in there. Yeah. Uh, for me, though, I couldn't reconcile the guilt. I couldn't reconcile that if you don't believe like I, it's like God was Santa Claus. If you're naughty, I'm going to send you to hell. And if you're nice, you go to heaven. So I kind of had to move away from that. But after I had those experiences, and I met, you know, I wrote Dr. Barry Downing, um, uh, wrote that book, you have, uh, uh, The Bible and Flying Saucers. Morris K. Jessup wrote a book. Um, oh God, what was it? It was, well, it was the Bible, Flying Saucers in the Bible. He died under mysterious circumstances in the 50s. A woman, and now we got some female energy in it, Virginia, Reverend Virginia Brasington, who was from Asheville, North Carolina, wrote a book called The Bible Flying Saucers, which I have in my collection. And so, so, so it was starting to be around me. Now the things I needed, the books were coming my way, the people were coming my way. And so I started looking at Yahweh because I said, what kind of God will have you killing women and children and taking people's land? And he seemed like he needed anger management. And so reading Zachariah Sitchin's work and whatever, I said, maybe this guy is an extraterrestrial. Unlike my friend Barry, who thought that, Michael, you just want your God to be warm and fuzzy. Sometimes your God has to destroy and what, and I get that. I, I know Hindu cosmology and metaphysics, but Yahweh just seemed mean. Okay, I don't know who Yahweh is. Is Yahweh a Yahweh character? is the God of the Moses. Yahweh is the God of the Old Testament. Oh, okay. Okay. And, and he, was so, mean. <laughs> he was mean. Well, you know, he picks the Jewish people out and he sets them against everybody else. You have to be circumcised. You're not supposed to intermarry. He's the one who leads the, Israel, uh, the, the Israelites out of Egypt. And reading the works of these people, I started saying, yeah, you know, there's these things in the sky. There's the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. And, these, and the Israelis are, fo are following something in the sky when they leave Egypt. Mm -hmm. And by day, it looks like the, the, the pillar of fire. I mean, uh, the pillar of cloud. And we know UFOs can hide in clouds where they can elicit the stuff to camouflage themselves. At night, it glows. So it's the pillar of fire. They're using the words that they can mm -hmm. use to try to explain the technology that they're seeing. Mm -hmm. So I started looking at flying chariots, every cosmology. 
has something flying in the air. So, so I was looking in the Bible after reading these other people. And I was the only difference between myself and them was that I was having contacts and they weren't, or if they were, they weren't telling anybody. Mm -hmm. And then, um, uh, and so I looked at Elijah and I looked at Moses and I looked at every time I saw a flying chariot, or, or I looked at angels. I said, every time, if I put the word ET everywhere I see angel, the Bible makes more sense because angel means messenger in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. and, and, and nowhere in the Bible does it say they had wings. I think our ancestors drew wings to try to tell us these beings could fly. Mm -hmm. Now, for some of your viewers, I'm not saying there's no such thing as angels. Mm -hmm. I'm just saying, I'm just trying to connect some dots. Mm -hmm. Then I started thinking about Jesus. And yes, there are thousands of virgin birth stories, but we know that in the literature that there are many women who haven't had sex in a while and they have a dream and they can't explain it but they wind up pregnant and right. then they go to their doctor and their doctor says yeah you're pregnant and then they have this dream again and the baby's gone yeah yeah and the word virgin in hebrew is alma a-l-m-a it doesn't mean a woman who uh it just mean it doesn't mean uh it means young girl. It doesn't mean a woman who's had her hymen broken. Right. It means young girl. And then I said, okay, if she was, she was a young girl, but let's say she was a virgin. We know that ETs have the technology to do that. Yeah. They can make a woman pregnant without her having sex at all. But not only ETs. I mean, today, obviously 2,000 years ago, but humans have the technology to do that too. Right. But right. back then they didn't. But back yeah. then they didn't. Yeah. And so we have this man, and unfortunately, it's mostly men that we hear about. And, you know, he's, to me, if your mother is human and your daddy isn't, because Joseph is a stepfather, he dies later on, but he says, my father in heaven. So if your mom is human Hang and on, your daddy isn't, that means wait. you're not human. You're not fully human. Joseph was was his stepfather, not his father. If if my if my father is in heaven, then that's my father. That's my father. If my mom's a virgin and my father is in heaven, she was he was impregnated, then Joseph's not my biological father. Okay, so what you're saying is that his father was an extra dimensional, extra true. He's saying my heavenly father. Yeah. Okay. Oh. He's saying that he was, I mean, he's not saying it, but if we say he's born of a virgin, that means that Joseph did not have sex with Mary. So then how did she get pregnant with him? Mm. Now, some people would argue it was Angel Gabriel, because Gabriel's job all in the Bible, everywhere Gabriel goes, women get pregnant. <laughs> really? <laughs> it's a great job. It's usually, <laughs> older, women. It's usually older women, though. Uh, yeah, the, the angel, the angel comes to Sarah, Abraham's wife, right? Gabriel's even in the Quran. The, 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 the Gabriel comes to, to uh, um, Elizabeth, Mary's cousin, John the Baptist's mother. He comes to her. You're pregnant. He comes to Miriam. Mary, you're pregnant. It's a great job. It's a great job. So, so if, if, if we say that, if we, if we take it literally that she's found favor with God, she gets pregnant. It's, you know, well, remember, the angel has to go to um, Joseph and say, look, chill, it's not your baby, but we need you to do this. Remember, because he doesn't want to, you know, he doesn't want to do this. You mean she's already pregnant? That's a scandal. That's a Shonda, as they say in Hebrew. So he has to go to, to Joseph. And I'm paraphrasing, but basically, get with the program. This is all a plan. Okay, so we can say that. If you don't believe that, you have to say, well, okay, if he's impregnated, if it's, she's impregnated by an angel or whoever, whoever impregnated her was not human. Her mother is human, which makes him a hybrid, which well, explains... If, if I'm not human, if my mother is not human and my daddy is, 
or my daddy's not human and my mother is, I'm a hybrid. Part of me is not human and part of me is. There's mm. no argument with that. Mm -mm. And so the point being is that it explains turning water into wine, if you want to believe that. It explains to him being able to walk on water. I'm sure if we saw an extraterrestrial would walk on, they could do those things as well. Yeah. So what you're saying is all the miracles that were purported that Jesus uh, did is because he was a higher conscious or an extra dimensional being who had yeah. the ability to do that much like all the higher conscious beings do much like the healing that the Pele Arcturian they're telling me it was that gave you the healing uh, the blonde dude with the muscles <laughs> yeah. okay uh, you, you know Dolores Cannon uh before she left I saw her talking about one of her clients that she hypnotized talking about the light, uh, you know, the birth of Jesus and that the light was the light, that the star in the sky was this sort of spaceship beaming down. It was a ship, yeah. Yeah, yeah it was a ship. That's what I'm saying. There because, 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 you know, listen, um, Karen, if, if a star moved from here to there, the whole gravitational pull of the earth. You want to talk about tidal waves and tsunamis and, and stars don't shine lights down on mangers, but ships do. And people follow this, the people from the east. Yeah. They follow this star. Now, some people say they were Buddhists or Zoran, but they knew that there was a, a high conscious being being born in the land of Israel. So have you asked Jesus about this? Have you spoken to him about it? No. Oh, all right. Um, so um, where do I want to go with this? You said that he's a hybrid. We're all hybrids. Every being on earth, every human form is a hybrid. You know, the, 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 um, the ETs that have been overlooking the evolution of the the humans on this earth have been tweaking our DNA for eons of time, but how we, how we develop higher consciousness is that we have to change the, the DNA of the body. So um, there are a lot of healers out there saying, you know, get a DNA to upgrade years ago when I started studying energy healing, it was called, um, somebody said, you know, come and do this DNA healing course. It's about changing the, the double helix strand of the DNA to a multiple strand of DNA. Like there's a lot of talk about changing our physical structure so that we can change and hold higher consciousness. So when I hear you say that he was a hybrid, what I'm receiving is that they tweaked his DNA, the body of the the body that the consciousness would come into had to be tweaked so that he could hold higher consciousness to be the teacher that he came to be because the veil of forgetfulness because we're all masters when we're not here on earth you know rolling around in physical bodies but and we come into this environment and we forget you know we have this forgetfulness and then we have to remember but that forgetfulness is to do with the body it's the body that we're wearing that enables us to have this forgetting of who we are as the extension of the source, as, as genius creators, as empowered people. And so definitely his DNA was tweaked before the consciousness of Jesus took on the body. So the, the ETs were doing that. Whether his father was an alien or not, they probably used both the sperm and the egg of Mary and Joseph and just tweaked his DNA. But... Uh, well, I mean, who knows? I mean, I mean, I don't know if any of that is true. I, I can, I can say I believe that. I mean, I can't prove that. Um, for me, it's like saying Jesus was a Jew, which he was, but he was a different kind of Jew. Every Jew in Palestine at that time did not have what Jesus had, and so for me, I, 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 like, like we were talking about where are they from or whatever. They don't stick around long enough or whatever, but I don't even care because for me, it's about how I live my life. And I can get caught up in the paralysis of analysis, paralysis. but for me, it's okay, whether you came from up the street where I buy my wine or whether you came from Zeta Reticuli, I need, it doesn't really matter in the long run for me because it's how I live my life 
And the human beings, we want to put things in boxes and this, that, and the other, and we can miss the forest for the trees. I do happen to believe, but I could never prove, that they did tweak him. I think that 40-day period where he went away in the wilderness, I'm sure he was in touch with them. Who knows what was going on? Mm -hmm. he, was, he was physical enough that he bled. He was physical enough to know hunger. I believe he was physical enough to know love. The point is, is how he lived his life mm, mm. for me. Because that's why that's the example life for me. It's like Dr. King, one of my heroes. If it was breathing, Dr. King had sex with it. Okay, that's another part of his life. But for me, he gave his life for a universal cause of brother and sisterhood. And so I try to cut away the fat and spit out the bones because this is what's going to help me live my life because I can talk all this stuff, but people are going to say, I'm going to watch how Reverend Carter lives. That's what's most important. And people like Jesus or Buddha or Mother Teresa or Joan of Arc or whoever, these avatars or just ordinary people doing extraordinary things they are the examples of how to live a committed life. All right, well, let's get into that a bit before we close. Mm -hmm. Great unrest in the US, not so much yes. in Australia. We did have a, um, when the first uh, Black Lives Matter movement happened in the US, we did have a big march here in Australia and all our Indigenous Aboriginals got out there and started screaming about the injustice of being a, a Indigenous in Australia. And mm -hmm. uh, But that calmed down. I, I, I don't think it has calmed down in the US. How would you, what would you say to people about how to live their lives during this time of great unrest? Well, I can only go by what I do, and I'll use the poet Tagore. He said that a person who plants a tree in the shade, knowing that he or she will never see it grow, is beginning to understand the meaning of life. A lot of the things that we're fighting for, hopefully we will see. And some of them we won't, but we're doing it for the next generation. This is a, this is a lifelong journey this evolution we have here. I'm standing on the shoulders of other ancestors as well. What I would say to people is whatever spiritual path you have, lean on it, draw on it, because this is a marathon, not a sprint. And as in Eastern philosophy, don't get attached to the outcome. You do good because good is good to do. If you get attached to the outcomes, you will always fall into the trap of change isn't happening fast enough. I've been marching here, I've been marching there, I've been doing this, I've been doing that. I get that. I get it because people are saying, man, I've been protesting this shit since the 60s or 50s. I get that. And that's only human. But you, can, you have to move past it at some point. But even now, I never thought I would see the things in this country that I've seen already. And so I'm living in times that I'm standing on the shoulders of other. I never thought I'd see a president of color. I never thought I'd see a woman running for president, much less vice president. I never thought I'd see people having conversations about Confederate flags and just why are we still fighting the Civil War. I never thought I'd start, see the Berlin Wall come down. Things happen. And by raising the frequency, not unless you, not unless you're, you were chosen to be a king or a Dalai not Lama. Maybe that's your, your soul pick doing that. That's something else. My soul didn't pick that. But what I'm doing is changing the world in my small way. I'm raising the frequency by trying to be, to live with some integrity, to try to live with a little love, to try to live uh, uh, with a little compassion. That's what I would tell people. And things happen. They, John Lewis, who was the one who was in King's movement, he was a congressman here. I'm sure you've heard about him there. He lived to see a black president. He lived to see the conversations that we had now. And so he was fortunate. We all don't, but we are seeing changes. But I think if you get attached to outcomes, it's not happening fast enough. Evolution can be slow. 
Yeah, evolution's slow, as they say in the Bible. It can be. It can be. Not always, but it can be. I'm not even religious, but I know this one. And the sins of the father are visited on the son. You know, the only reason evolution is slow is because these beautiful light beings are born into the world, you know, immersed in love and light. And you, you'd watch children. Children don't don't have any prejudice or judgment or race. They don't, they don't see race. And then we teach them how to be, um, you know, I remember my parents saying to me, oh, you don't want to speak to people that live, you know, in those suburbs. You know, they were teaching me prejudice. They were teaching me how to be a snob. I grew up in a wealthy uh, environment and they told me that people that lived a few suburbs away were not worth talking to. And then yeah. I, and then my father lost all his money and I went to a different school that was closer to those suburbs that he talked about. And I met all these people from all those suburbs and I remember scratching my head going, my my family lied to me. These people are great. They come from these suburbs. What you know? They lied to me. So I think that if we stop visiting the sins of the father on the son, we would have uh, evolution because we don't come in with any sort of form of prejudice. We just, we're taught it. And um, I, I remember a conversation with my daughter. A friend of mine died and she was quite young and she had this best friend who was a black guy that she did coaching with in the corporate world. And they were, they had a secular funeral, a non-religious funeral, and they were looking for someone to speak at her funeral as be the master of ceremonies. And so um, her best friend was telling me a conversation that she'd had with her mother, who was very snobby, born up in the same area, brought up in the same area with this snobby ideas. And she suggested this beautiful young man to speak. And she goes, oh, no, we can't have a black man speak at the golf club, you know, this attitude. And I remember this friend that had had this conversation with my friend's mother. It's a bit confusing. And I'm having this conversation in front of my daughter, who was about 18 at the time. And we were laughing at the ridiculousness of her prejudice and saying, oh, my God, you know, laughing at how silly she was. And my daughter was saying, why can't you have a black man in the golf club? Like, she did not get it. She didn't get the prejudice. She just, it wasn't in her consciousness. And I loved that, that she just did, you know, she just didn't even understand why we thought that was so funny and that it was so prejudiced. She didn't understand it. So if we didn't teach them, you know, we would, we'd live in a different world, wouldn't we? Because we're not born with these ideas. So we just have to stop engaging in these ideas. Even the protests are engaging in these ideas, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I think it's a little simplistic. And here in our country, see, because most of the white people in our country, they look at racism as the skinhead or the neo-Nazi. or And it's not about that at all. They're a symptom of it. We're talking about systems. Yeah. We're talking about organizational structures that were founded like this. So it's not so much... Yeah. Um, you know, well, I, you know, kumbaya, and I know that's not what you're saying. It's not, well, you know, it's not one-on-one. -on -one. It's, we have organizations, we have the military, we have the police forces, we have all these societal structures that are built on racism, and it's harder to dismantle that. It's not just the one-on-one. -on -one. Yeah. It's that we're a police you know force who does that. You know what's crazy, Michael? those systems still include the most the most prejudice i won't call it racism prejudice is against women because those systems are still in place where women will do the same job as a man and get paid less in yes. television in government i don't know about government but in so many corporations. oh no it's yeah. in government and see that's what i mean by the system because the system was built that way at least in this country yeah. The system was built that way, that in America, people of color and women were second class citizens. And yeah. so you have your, 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 your golf clubs, you have your, your restaurants, you have your military, you have, you know, yeah. your police force. They're all built on this male, patriarchal, white supremacy. Yeah. And so what's happening here, which I thank God, because King did it back in the, in the 60s, most of the protesters here are white brothers and sisters, but they're getting it. That it's not just because my neighbor happens to marry a black person or it's not prejudiced individually. It's a system that has to be dismantled. Dismantled, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that's happening. And I think that's what the, I think that the ETs realize that as well. 
in the sense of, because whether they're saying we don't believe in all those structures and whatever, they do realize that those structures exist. Yeah. You know, that, that earth, that's why, that's why they're saying you guys got to change your structures. You got to open your heart. You got to change your institutions because that's where it lies. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, beautiful. But I have hope. I'm hopeful. And I what, think there's a new, a new world is being born. A new world if we can take it. That's Absolutely. right. Absolutely. And, and much of the old world is being dismantled. And so That's right. we're seeing a lot of chaos, a lot of uh, rampaging through the streets, rampaging through the streets. And yeah. uh, people are sending me, uh, I have a lot of people that send me a lot of stuff, which is really interesting. It gets overwhelming, but it's fascinating to see what's happening around the world. People are sending me video after video after video after video of the protests around the world. There are just thousands of them. Yeah, the whole planet, the whole consciousness. It's, it's, it's messy and it's going to be, but people are saying the old structures don't work anymore. Yeah, they're rebelling. Whether you're in China, whether you're in Australia, whether you're in Beijing, whether you're in the United States, and that's, that's what the age of Aquarius is about, but you have to get there. Yeah. Right. Living up in Australia for another big march all around Australia. I think it's on yeah. the, on the fifth of September, which is in a couple of days. It's in a couple so, of days. Yeah. So it's it continues, and a new world if you can take it. Don't it's being born. It's being born. <laughs> thank you so, so much. Listen, I want to thank. Listen, I want to just say to people before I go, my books are on Amazon. Uh, you know, you can go to my website michaeljscarter.com. Uh, if you want to write me, I will write you back. I write back everybody. Uh, but if you want to read those books, keep the faith, stay healthy. Nothing lasts forever. COVID will one day go away as well. I want to thank you for having me on the show. And I want to ask you if you could send me a link, like an email to my email. Yeah, absolutely. Because I want to send this to people yeah, sure. here in the States. And it's easier for me to send it by email. You have my email, right? Yeah. 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 Michael J. S. Carter at Gmail. Yeah. And I will get the word out. Get but the this word has out. Been, fun. This, has been, this has been a joy. And I'm glad we covered everything. You know, I can always come back on and go more in depth with this stuff. I know we had a little time. We didn't have as much time, but maybe next time. I know that there's a lot to talk about. Uh, but I think the main message that we covered is uh, love thy neighbor. <laughs> yes, love, love. we got to up. learn to love, yes. Otherwise, we're going to destroy ourselves. Yeah, absolutely. Including the cosmic neighbor, even if somebody turns up and he looks like a 10-foot prey mantis. <laughs> love him. That's right. you got to love him. They love you. And if they don't, they can learn to. <laughs> Yeah, that's diversity. That's diversity. <laughs> that's diversity. Praying mantis, uh, Nordics, greys, Arcturians. I guess that the, the, the Nordics with the muscles, you know, and the blonde hair, and that they're kind of more palpable to, to react to because they're more human. That's right. Yes. But yes. There, are so many, there are so many, uh, you know, off-world beings that don't look anything close to human. <laughs> It's just nothing close. I, yes. you know? Oh my God, I, I probably would have had a heart attack. But as, and people have told me they've even seen extraterrestrials or off-world people who are who are brown skinned I mean, they're green, they're blue, they're you know, green, it's blue. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's just that we here, like you said, I mean, if it's different, we will either be afraid of it or we'll shoot at it or we'll do all of it. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, or, or not it, but he or she or what have you. But yeah. um, I think you're doing a wonderful thing by raising the vibration, the frequency of the planet. And I'm trying to do my part over here on this side and we're not alone. And so this is how the world changes. Well, thank you for your work and thank you again for being on the show, Michael. All right, my dear. Have a great evening. I thank you. Wonderful to have Michael on the show. And if you do want to support the show, I will put the links to my our Amazon links on the website page. If you're listening to this on YouTube or any of the audio platforms like Apple or 
Spotify or wherever you're listening to this. Uh, if you go to the website page, I always put the link in the description. And um, if you are interested in Michael's books, you can buy them on Amazon through our links and we get a couple of cents. It supports the show in some way. <laughs> I'm not relying on it because I think in 10 years of doing this, I've probably only made $100. <laughs> From that, anyway, <laughs> it's, all, it's all, you know, adds up, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, fascinating, fascinating, fascinating conversation with uh, Reverend Michael Carter. He gets around, doesn't he? He's been on so many shows. Funny that I hadn't seen him on any of them. But I guess that if you're into the UFO phenomena, there's, you know, there seems to be, as we talked about with uh, Sue Walker, you know, she's done a lot of UFO conferences. There seems to be this merging of spirituality and UFO because there's there was this very separate, separate, um, separateness of the UFO people and the spiritual people were at, going to different conferences and they're talking about different things. Lots of people about lights in the sky, lights in the sky. What is that? What is that? <laughs> that was a whole conversation. And then there are many people who, you know, like I've had people on the show who have direct contact with their ET off world beings who channel the language of light and channel their messages, the Palladian messages, Arcturian messages. And, and then there are people like Michael who are contactees. It doesn't seem like he's channeling their messages or talking to them through telepathy. He's definitely having contact with them and he's definitely in his knowing of why he's here and what he's here to do. He's got a mission, you know, the reconciliation, the Christ consciousness mission, that's his mission. So he knows what he's here to do. So maybe he doesn't really need to channel their messages. He's, he's got his work cut out for him. So good on him. It's so needed. And uh, maybe you can be an agent for change in that way too. Just love thy neighbour make up with somebody who you've had a fight with because difference is difference of opinion as much as anything else, not just difference in attitudes and skin colour and religions and culture, but difference of opinion. You know, can we love somebody that thinks completely differently to us? Uh, can we hang out with people who think that UFOs are crazy and, you know, you're a mad person if you believe in them? Uh, can we love the difference of opinion? Yeah. The zealous religious person can we love them the atheist can we love them viva la difference anyway such important work and uh yes who's coming up i don't know i have to have a look uh mary rodwell actually more on the uh, ufo theme is coming into the inner sanctum this week uh this weekend and she's going to talk about the star children as she does and we'll quiz Mary. I've had Mary on the show, you know, almost a dozen times uh, and, and into the inner sanctum. And she's done seminars in my home, workshops in my home. Just love Mary. She's just so full of wisdom and knowledge and information and such a delight. She's so down to earth and funny. Just love Mary. So she's coming back into the inner sanctum. And I have a friend coming up next week, actually, Kate Raymond, who is uh, does angel paintings. And I went to see Kate. Last weekend, I took my friend David up to meet her in the Blue Mountains. If you follow me on Facebook, you would have seen that I, it snowed for us. It doesn't often snow in the Blue Mountains. It's about an hour and a half uh, west of Sydney. Sydney's on the coast, east coast. And uh, we had snow. We, we had snow and Dave and I were out there screaming like children going, ah, snow, snow. <laughs> so that was a bit of a boon. Here we are, first day of spring, which was yesterday. And two weeks ago, we we're in the snow. I put, I put some flowers on and some green on today to celebrate the first day of spring. So Kate has an amazing story. I've known her for 20 years or more and seen her progression with the angels. And, uh, yeah, so that'll be fun talking to Kate um, next week. And who else is coming up on the show? Uh, oh, Preston is coming in after Kate. Preston that we talked about, Dennett. ET healing. We're going to talk more about ET and healing. He's just a wealth of information. Preston talks on many, many, many things. I could have Preston on the show a dozen times and we, we wouldn't get past what he's written in his books. He's extensive. And then, um, oh, Lois Hollis is coming on the show. We're going to talk about, she speaks on shame. We're going to talk about shame and how that manifests in our life. That's going to be really interesting. Lots of people shaming everybody at the moment. So it's up in our faces. So that's going to be really interesting. Oh, Blossom's coming on, who channels the Palladian Collective. I think she channels everyone. She's got the mob at hand. 
I love Blossom. She's this English woman, but she lives in Queensland in Australia and she's hilarious and she's profound. You can go on YouTube and listen to her channelings. They're wonderful. And uh, Susan Raven, who's a musician, conscious musician, is going to come. Janet, oh, another near-death experiencer. Yeah, so I've got quite a few people uh, coming in. Judy Satori later in November. Oh, and Tom Barnett is going to come on. I'm going to do a Facebook Live with him in a couple of weeks uh, and I'll upload that to the, all the platforms. He's a fascinating young man, lives up near Byron. Uh, he, he, fascinating, fascinating young man. We're going to talk about the virus, what is a virus, how you catch a virus. He's well-versed in all that. Uh, we're going to talk about some politics, um, sovereignty. Mm, it be a really interesting conversation with Tom. So he's coming up in a couple of weeks too. So lots happening, lots happening. Love to see you in the inner sanctum if you want to join us. Uh, we have conversations. I give people home play, homework, home play, I say. You know, get them to talk to dead people or talk to people that, you know, in their meditation. doesn't matter if you can't or if you get it wrong. We just play with all this stuff, expand our consciousness. Uh, what else? Do something that scares you. We gave, we gave them a few challenges this week. Um, a lot of people are scared, just like, just like Michael was saying, you know, if you've got a message or you start channeling, I had a young girl join that only two years ago, less than two years ago, you know, this Archangel Michael turns up while she's in the bath and she didn't know anything about this stuff. And now she's doing readings and channeling. But you think you're a mom or you're, you know, working at a bank like Serena did that I spoke to last week. And then you've got a message and now you've got to put that message out there. And it can be really, really scary to sort of get on camera and start talking to camera. A lot of people who receive messages from their guides or channel, you know, can do it really easily with writing, but it does make it easier if you can sort of put your face on camera or just your mouth to the microphone and, and start speaking it. Just makes it more accessible for people to hear what you or they have to say. So when I gave people the challenge, do something and scare you, scares you, you know, talking to a camera, doing a piece to camera, it can be one of those scary things. I was in an old computer uh, that I haven't opened for years and I looked at it and I saw all these videos of me practicing it about 11 years ago. My guides had said to me, put your face on camera, get out there on YouTube and talk. And I'm still reticent to do it. You know, like I, I love talking to other people, but I still don't do it as much as they ask me to do. And I was watching myself practicing <laughs> and I'm just a mess. I'm a hot mess, just like, just anyway, just full of self-criticism. And so we have to get over our self-criticism, not just the criticism of others. Really the criticism of others is a, um, is tells you how you criticize yourself because we're one. So if you're, if you're hating on others or criticizing them or judging them, really it's, it's how you judge yourself. So uh, yeah, we have to get over that, that self criticism and judgment of self too. That's, that's embodying more of the Christ consciousness, reconciliation with the self and, um, and your personality and your body and your mind and all of it, just loving all of it. Yeah, so do something that scares you and uh, I'll see you soon. I haven't got much else to say. See you in the Inner Sanctum or, you know, you can book private ses sessions with me if you want to know, know more about how you create your life and um, how to tune into being more deliberate, how you flow your energy so you can create a life and a world we all want to live in. Love you all. Bye for now.